Hi guys, welcome to the last video in uh, our section on Congress. This is pretty going to be a pretty short video. Um, we have talked about how uh, congressional elections work. We have talked about um, the basic functions of Congress and how members of Congress approach their um, jobs. Uh, in the two videos you'll watch after this, we'll talk about how committees work and the leadership and the structure of Congress. But in this video, we're just going to talk about how a bill becomes a law. And yes, you did just hopefully watch the lovely uh, Schoolhouse Rock version. Well, the reason that I show that and the reason that it stands up over time is because it's largely accurate. There are some details that we'll go over that aren't part of that video. But in terms of just the process of having a bill getting written... Um, like the guy who says, oh, there ought to be a law, and he calls his member of Congress. Now, sometimes it's not quite that straightforward. As we know, interest groups help write laws. They, they try to set the agenda. But all bills, as they become a law, start out as an idea. Somebody saying, wait, we, we ought to do this. We ought to change the way something um, works. We ought to increase the um, standards for air quality in the United States. Um, and so that's how it works. Now, what we're actually going to use is this um, chart of for how a bill becomes a law. This is not from your book, um, but it's the best, most straightforward version of this that I've ever seen. And the way to think about it is that it's largely the same process, though the House and the Senate have different... Um, uh, they have different histories of how their workflow developed, um, and so they've got some different things going on, largely because in the House there are so many people that there have to be more ways to organize conversation about a bill, right? I mean, just think about what it's like having class discussions with just the 115 or so of us in this class, right? So if everybody had something to say, then it would be hard to manage that, even as me, a t as a teacher on the front. Well, there's four times that many people in the House of Representatives. The Senate's process is strongly reflects the idea that each member of the Senate has their own power. And there's only a hundred of them, um, but they are much freer in terms of how they structure debate, and they're much less reliant on the expectations of the majority and minority leaders. So let's go through this process. Um, if you look at the upper left-hand corner, we'll start in the House. So the first thing that happens is that a bill is introduced. Um, into uh, consideration in the House. Um, it used to be, now I think it's more, and now it's electronic, but it used to be there was actually like a big box um, up at the front and near the speaker's podium called the hopper, and you'd throw the bill, your proposed bill, in there, and then it would get assigned a number, um, and then it would be referred to a House committee. Now that's up to the um, speaker of the House usually, and it matters because when a bill is referred to a committee, that's the committee that's going to scrutinize it, that's going to pay a lot of attention to it. Um, and then usually in the House, it's referred by the chair of that committee into a subcommittee, so a smaller group of people um, from that committee who's more, even more specialized, right? So there are, as you'll find out later on, there's a group of committees that are linked to large policy areas, right? So there's a transportation committee. There is a, um, there's a committee on military and defense. There's a committee on energy, right? So there's all these sort of big, there's a committee on agriculture, right? So there are all these big committees. Well, within those large subject areas, there are smaller subject areas. And that's what, so that's what subcommittees are. So within the transportation um, committee, there are subcommittees on air transportation, on rail, on cars, right? Like all those kinds of things. So a bill is then going to be referred to a subcommittee. And in that subcommittee is where they're going to do a lot of the work of really sort of reading through that bill and what's called the markup, um, where um, the uh, subcommittees are basically allowed to make amendments as they go, as they're working through that. Many times they'll have, um, they'll hold hearings where people will testify about the bill or what needs to be in a, in a bill like this or the interests that are involved. Um, and then what happens is that the, the subcommittee votes. And as you'll see later on, that subcommittee is made up usually of the same um, 
proportion of Republicans and Democrats as are in the entire House. So um, right now, since the Democrats are in charge of the House, the Democrats are in charge of committees and they're in charge of subcommittees. So the, a subcommittee will vote. And if the subcommittee approves of the bill as they have amended it, then it goes to the full committee. And the full committee talks about it. And those committees in the House are like 30 people. Um, so they'll talk about it, and they might have hearings, and they'll do more markup, and then they will report it back to the House. Um, so that means it can go to be, they have approved it to be considered by the full House. So they have a majority of the people on the committee have approved it. Now the thing is, is that with that idea of a bill being referred to these committees, there are all these places where they can die because the chair of that committee can choose not to talk about it, right? So the chair has agenda power. So the, the, a bill gets introduced, the, um, it's given a number, the speaker of the house can refuse to refer it to a committee. So it'll die. Or they can, the speaker will refer it to a committee and that committee chair says, this is not important, I'm not assigning this to a subcommittee. And then it dies because it doesn't get a vote out of the committee. Or it can be referred to a, sub, a subcommittee chair and that subcommittee chair can say, this is not important, we're not going to consider it, we're not going to vote on it, and so it will die. So there are all these places where bills can die. So let's assume in the House that it gets voted out of the full committee. Well, in the House, there's then a special rules committee, which is about um, determining how that bill will be considered on the floor. Now, the, there's a lot of different things that can happen, but here's the, the basic example that will help you understand what's going on in the rules committee. So you don't want 435 people all talking about this, right? So what happens in a rules committee is that rules are placed on the bill, which can be something to the effect of no floor amendments, and each person, each member gets 10 minutes to speak, right? That's a pretty basic, like, we're getting this bill through past kind of set of rules. Um, because it lets people talk if they want to, but they don't have to, and they only have 10 minutes, and there can't be any floor amendments. There are other versions of that that could happen. And so if it, and guess what? The Rules Committee can also refuse to give a bill rules, and then it can die there, too. Um but if a bill has made it out of the rules committee, then it goes to the floor and then debate happens on the floor, which are those people that are talking and um, perhaps offering amendments, perhaps not, depending on the rules, and then the House votes on it. Well, guess what? That's awesome. It's been through the House and now it has to go through the Senate. Now, the Senate committee process is pretty similar in the sense that it's the majority leader who assigns it to a committee and it can, you know, it can vary what committee a particular bill goes to. Sometimes it can be referred to multiple committees depending on what is in the bill. Sometimes large spending bills go to multiple committees. Um, but once you get through the committee stages where it can also die in all those same ways, um, the full committee will report it back out to the Senate and then it goes directly to the floor. There is no rules committee in the Senate. And there's also no um, ability to stop debate. They can't put rules on before they go in because each member has um, the power of unlimited debate. And that's what filibusters are, are about. So if a person decides or a group of people decide that they don't want this bill to pass and they just want to like talk it to death and keep it on the agenda, um, that's called a filibuster where you just keep talking and talking and talking. And the way to end a filibuster is by getting enough votes for a cloture motion, which basically means cloture is a um, motion to end debate on something. And so under normal circumstances, they vote to end debate and then they vote to move to, to consider the bill. Under the situation of a filibuster, they have to get a cloture, um, they have to get a cloture agreement, which means that 60 members of the Senate are willing to cut off debate. And, and so it's kind of hard to get there when um, the numbers in the Senate are as close as they usually are. But assuming it's not filibustered, assuming the Senate decides to pass the bill, there's still what's called conference action because the Constitution requires that the bills that are passed have exactly the same language. Well, if it's been through 
um, committees in both the House and the Senate, it's unlikely that it's exactly the same language um, when it gets the, that the bills that are approved in each House are exactly the same language. And so then there's a conference committee made up of members of the House and the Senate together who uh, work out a compromised version of the, of the bill so that both the House and the Senate then re-vote on the bill based on the conference report or based on the new bill that it has been worked out by this compromise. And then if both houses pass that, then it goes to the president. Right. So that's why lawmaking is so complicated. Right. There's so many different processes by which um, these bills go through. And the idea is it's meant to be our representatives doing their job to deliberate on these issues, to make sure that they are passing um, just and effective laws. And so when it gets to the White House, the president has three options. The president can sign it, and then it becomes law. The president can veto it, and then there's a process by which you, if you get two-thirds of a positive vote in both the House and the Senate, a veto can be overridden. It doesn't happen very often. Um, and then there's what's called a pocket veto, which doesn't happen very often anymore. Um, but the but the idea is that a pocket veto means that a bill is basically vetoes or dies if the president declines to sign it and Congress um, adjourns within 10 days. Well, Congress very rarely adjourns now, um, but it, in the earlier part of the um, of the country, um, presidents would use that all the time when they didn't want to actually actively veto something but didn't want to sign it either. President Lincoln had a ton of these pocket vetoes um, because he didn't want to sort of go on record opposing something. Um, but that's pretty rare now in our in the way that our system works currently. So that's the sort of long-winded version of how a bill becomes a law. But I strongly recommend you um, continue to look at this visual because it's probably the best, most straightforward. So the House floor procedures, as we talked about, that depends on the rules placed on the bill by the Rules Committee, and those rules govern debate. And that's really the important distinction in terms of the House process. And like I said about the Senate, the, the important distinction on Senate processes is that senators have a lot more individual power and they have unlimited time to debate. And that's part of the rules of the Senate. So a filibuster means that they just talk and talk and talk. So for example, um, the Civil Rights Act of 1964 was filibustered for four and a half or five months by Southern Democrats in the Senate. Um, until they got, and you'll see a video about this actually next week, um, until the president got made deals to get a cloture vote, to get the Senate to cut off debate and finally vote. Um, and cloture now means that three-fifths of the Senate has to vote to end debate, or 60 um, of the 100. It used to be higher. Um, it started at, when cloture started out, remember these are rules that the Senate has put on themselves, right? These are not constitutional requirements. These are rules that the Senate has created for themselves. And they can change it, right? Like, we won't go into this, but um, the Republicans, when they came into power in the 1990s, did a bunch of changing of the rules of the House that have had impact on how the House operates um, even now um, um, and through the last 30 years as the Republicans and Democrats have traded power in the House. Anyway, when cloture was first um, created, you had to have 75 votes to end debate, and now it's down to 60. Uh, so this is a sort of an interesting thing of looking at. So this is sessions of Congress, not years, and you can see the 65th Congress was 1919, and the 114th was 2016. Um, this shows you the attempts at cloture. And I think that this is a really good example of party polarization. Why? Because over time, the, the Senate has felt the need to try to invoke um, clo cloture. So in this case, 16 senators have to file to request a, a cloture vote. Um, but as you can see, many more cloture filings are created than cloture is actually have invoked, having a filibuster stopped. Um, and so what we can see is that over time, um, the context of that argument in the Senate gets more and more um, complicated and more and more divisive. And it's particularly the case um, over the last uh, four years because the 
the division between Republicans and, and Democrats is so close. It's like been 51 49. Um, so that means that in order to invoke cloture, you have to get people from the other party to agree with you. So um, the Republicans are in charge of the Senate, right? So if Democrats want to filibuster something, they can do that. Um, and Republicans will need nine votes from Democrats in order to to, get, to gain cloture. That's a huge um, barrier to get, to get from 51 to 60 votes. And so this is why the whole idea of filibustering and cloture is such, not just a big deal, but it's actually a threat, right? You, you hear people talk about when, when bills move through the Senate, whether, um, whether one side or the other has a cloture proof majority. All right, so in the next videos you're gonna see from Crash Course, they're gonna talk about the committee system and the party leadership system, which will give you, they do a really good job of laying out um, what the internal structures are inside um, each house of Congress and how those impact policymaking and representation.